when I say uh, when I say justice, you say now. Justice now. Justice now. Peace now. Justice now. Battle now. Battle now. My name is Sarah Flanders, and I'm going to be sharing this session. I'm with the International Action Center and part of the UNAC Administrative Committee and a planner of this conference and the coalition on U.S. foreign military bases. I work with FIRE, fight for refugees and immigrants everywhere. I write for a Workers' World newspaper. But really, I'm on this panel speaking to you as one of the coordinators of the Sanctions Kill campaign. And that's what we want to address, sanctions. And the deadly, deadly impact. So, I think the most important thing for us is that we never underestimate the power of solidarity. Solidarity and unity consciously built, it's a material force and it can change history. And we should look at it that way. I'm still so excited by the news last night and if you missed it, and if you, even if you heard it, you're gonna hear it again. It's worth repeating because it's so rich in lessons for us right here today. When Greyhound announced that ICE no longer will board buses for ID. Because that's who travels by bus, overwhelmingly, and it's poor people. But it's organizing everyone who's legal to speak out for those who aren't. That's solidarity. And that means training and educating and mass leafleting and talking to people. It's legal pressure, it was union pressure, it was the bus drivers themselves, it's people's power. It was a campaign by migrant rights groups and supporters, and it involved rights training, involving millions of riders. Don't be silent. That was the message. Don't be silent. It involved the ACLU and legal suits. And it was going to be part of our march on Sunday, and now you can all be early on Sunday. <laughs> but it was against the largest fleet of buses, the most destinations, Greyhound. Now, the same is true for stop and frisk. This was an accepted, accepted police practice until it was challenged by tens and tens of thousands in the streets. And now it haunts Bloomberg. He was so proud of it. It was his campaign. He talked about it constantly. This racist practice. But it was accepted police practice. Promoted across the country. Until it's challenged. See, that's what's so important. It's either acceptable everywhere, or it's not. And that's our role and it has everything to do with how we see the sanctions campaign. I think a political movement, every political movement, it needs a big picture. We're facing a deadly world system. U.S. wars are everywhere and every day and 800 military bases. But the most pervasive weapon that seeps into every home and marketplace and school and hospital is the U.S. sanctions policy. 39 countries, a third of the world, and it's a threat to every country, every developing country. You know, there's very little understanding of how this capitalist system works on a global scale. And you can't oppose U.S. wars and regime change just piecemeal. We need campaigns that build on and reinforce our unity, that build solidarity with the most oppressed migrants here and with those targeted by this racist capitalist system and all those targeted around the world. 
Now, explaining sanctions' most deadly form of war is both difficult, and yet if we focus on it, it can be very simple. It can be part of what we're actually talking about. That's why the, the, the coordinated days, three weeks from now, mid-March, March 13 to 15, think about one thing that you could do during that time. Even if it's a mass leaflet, putting up stickers in the subway. I mean, think of what you can do, a graphic, and a song. Pass a resolution. Has lots of potential. The San Francisco Central Labor Council passed a unanimous resolution against sanctions and calling for actions mid-March. Now that's incredible. Can we get some other unions? There are several other unions because of that now planning to pass resolutions on sanctions. Can we get a radical city council maybe? Or a student council? Let's think about this. All kinds of resolutions against U.S. economic sanctions. It's been endorsed by thousands, translated into 18 languages by local activists, both here and around the world. And I'm talking about into Chinese and Farsi and Arabic and Bengali and Malay, Russian, Spanish, Portuguese, Creole, Korean, Malay, Japanese, many others. Venezuela has raised this as a key point of the non-aligned movement, passed overwhelmingly, unanimously also, against U.S. imposed economic sanctions. And we should not note it's all together on that. It's U.S. imposed. That's who's pushing this around the world. It's not development. It's can we impose underdevelopment, economic strangulation. It's a form of warfare. The African Union has demanded that sanctions be ended on Zimbabwe. Now, there, there are some countries we know little about. Why are they even sanctioned? A congressional resolution can just sail through unanimously, voice vote. How about, why are there sanctions on Mali, on Mauritania, on Rwanda, on Congo, on Somalia, on Sudan, on Gabon, on Guinea-Bissau? On Zimbabwe. On Iran, we might know about, and Iraq, and Afghanistan, and Yemen. These are all sanctioned countries. Lebanon, Gaza, Laos, Serbia, China, Russia. And, and I haven't listed half the countries yet. I haven't listed half the countries yet. So, where's this campaign going? What's it saying? This is a first step. We want to make the sanctions policy, U.S. imposed economic sanctions, a word so hated that it can evoke horror, like napalm. That's we have to change the thinking on this, like white phosphorus, like Agent Orange like the U.S. policy of smallpox blankets to indigenous peoples. That's the way the wars have been fought, always, with disease and hunger and isolation and separation. Economic strangulation. That's not a mild political censure. We're talking about economic sanctions. The impact is devastating. As I say, it needs a global campaign. And we should think about it. Like stop and frisk. Unacceptable. We're not going to allow it. It's a racist policy. Now, there are people here who have a lot of experience with campaigns. Let's look at the U.S. imposed sanctions on Iraq. The death of half a million children. Madeleine Albright said it's worth it. It's worth it. It's how they think. And it can't be how we allow this thinking to go on. I worked for years on that campaign, on the Iraq sanctions. We did videos and books and delegations and demonstrations and resolutions. And it changed the thinking on it. So today we want to be concrete. You see this chart here? Let's talk about what are sanctions. 
The U.S. and the European Union passed laws to ban, block, or restrict trade to a specific country or group or an individual. But that actually sanctions the whole country. You say, oh, this is only small. If you're on the OFAC list, you're not needed. That's a fact. Currencies are devalued, inflated when sanctions are levied. International credit ratings tank. Countries are pressured to stop doing business. Maybe this is most important. The first sectors affected are generally medicine, the cost of food, power, electricity, water treatment, other essential human needs. And it's because the U.S. holds trade and banking and military dominance over most of the world that these sanctions have killed millions. That's why. And the last point we said is sanctions violate international law, the UN Charter, the Geneva and Nuremberg Conventions because they target civilians by economic strangulation, by creating famines, by life-threatening shortages, and economic chaos. So look at that. Just even think where you can pass it out. It's good to explain to people how this works. Now, I'm speaking here because everyone here today is an organizer. That's a fact. That is a fact. So we want to expose the horror of this work. We want to we have all kinds of things up on the website, along with resolutions and fact sheets and translations and chant sheets. But we could have thousands more things. So submit material on every single country. When we link struggles, we build new bounds of solidarity. If you're doing Cuba work, think about linking it to the sanctions on Zimbabwe. You'll get the audience's attention. They'll see a larger picture. If you're focused on the Iran sanctions, bring in the sanctions on little Nicaragua and what that means. Maybe you're working on Venezuela. Include the sanctions on Gaza. Enlarge the understanding. Let's shake things up a bit and get outside our comfort zones and always link it back, all of us, to what it means right here. Millions cut off of food stamps, SSI, housing, whole parts of this country today, and it's getting much worse, that really are sanctioned. So I hope everyone here, while you're listening to the panel, while you're listening to every one of these speakers who focus on different areas of sanctions, who've worked on this campaign, are thinking about one thing you might be able to do March 13th to 15th, coordinated actions, the period before and the period after. Now, International League of People's Struggles is organizing a study group just next week. The December 12th movement had a big meeting at the National Black Theater last night in Harlem on the sanctions on Zimbabwe. Our Korean friends here, a demonstration in Washington, D.C. on March 15th. Let's talk about U.S. wars around the world signed the peace treaty on Korea decades and decades later. There's a national Cuba conference talking about the blockade of Cuba, March 21st and 22nd. Every Palestine demonstration, when we talk about the surrounding by the Israelis of Gaza, let's also bring in U.S. sanctions on Gaza. You know, you can't support an orphanage or a food program in Gaza from the U.S. That's a criminal offense. Is that outrageous? Yes. yes. So the first step, our first goal is to change how sanctions are viewed. It's not an alternative to war. It's war. It's war. And the most violent and brutal and horrific form of war. War on the most vulnerable. And we have to build that anger and outrage into a mobilized rage. Then it becomes a powerful force. Right now the deaths are silent and we have to break the silence. We have to break the silence. 
We have to make it no longer acceptable. Republicans and Democrats can just sail through on a voice vote the sanctions on another country. But first, we have to change it within this, our own political movement. That's the first, very first step. So that's why I say this is a room of organizers. It's a challenge. Let's think collectively. I really hope in the question and answer period there are very concrete proposals, people volunteering to do very concrete things. Every step of the way, we're going to be saying U.S. economic sanctions are not a diplomatic tool. U.S. economic sanctions are not political sanctions. Economic sanctions are using disease and hunger to rip countries apart. And in closing, I want to say that there are huge changes brewing in this country. We all feel it. There is a hatred of capitalism. That's a fact. So, and at the same time, there are lots of folks who speak in the name of socialism, but who don't address imperialist wars, imperialist policies. We want to talk to that movement. We want to talk to this whole current, but in concrete ways that link the whole world together. That's what really this is an attempt to do. For everyone who hates this system, we have to give them a bigger picture. So there are lots of concrete ways to link the world together, and I think we really, in doing it, need new confidence. If we can change thinking, if we can mobilize anger, we can change the world. Our next speaker, this is a great panel, by the way. These are folks that are really all involved deeply in this issue and educating us. <laughs> is Jayun Ri. She is an immigrant from South Korea who served as a program coordinator of education and exposure programs at the New York-based Nobito. She's helped to organize annual delegations of U.S. citizens to both North and South Korea since 2002. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stand. I'm not really good at sitting down and talk. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Juyan, and I'm a member of Noduto. Um, and obviously, I'm a Korean immigrant. <coughs> Currently, on, at Noduto, we are examining the term about imi being immigrant. We had a lot of, uh, one of uh, our members went to a decolonizing um, workshops, and then they said we are the Korean senators in this land. And, you know, um, so we have been in saying a lot about the immigrants' rights, and then we said that right is along with the U.S. imperialist that we are asking the rights to the imperialist, and you know we are asking to the wrong people. So, um, as I earlier I heard about the youth, um, the the role of youth. There is a lot of people who are active as a young people, and they are changing our perspectives, and they are bringing the new uh, wave to us. So I'm gonna just to talk about the sanctions about the DPRK. Um, and I'm going to try to use it, wait, maybe I can do it the other way. Got it. Okay. So, the U.S. sanctions, before I go into the sanctions, why do U.S. use the sanctions as a weapon of mass destruction? Or a weapon of war, this is a war. So a lot of times you will see the sanctions are designed to change the government to to the other in the, the other country to be a pro-U.S. military, pro-U.S. imperialist agenda. 
and they are trying to create more allies. And if they refuse, then they threat with missiles and bombs and everything else, and including the sanctions. So the North Korea, or the Korean Peninsula, has been in the uh, war for the, the last 70 years. So the sanctions has been also 70 years long. And the trade sanctions were since 1950 at the start of Korean War under the, the uh, 1917 Trading with the Enemy Act. This is a Congress, Congress um, pressed law. So, okay. Um, and then after the 19, uh, 1945, the end of the World War II, you will remember they divided, the Allied power divided the Germany, like that. And then at the, at the end of the, the World War II, the Korea was divided to the North Korea and South Korea. And two uh, lieutenant drove the 38th parallel to North and South. And then the Russia came to disarm, and then US came in to disarm the quote unquote, uh, to quote unquote disarm the Japanese powers. However, Korea had nothing to do with war, actually. So why wasn't the, US, the Japan be divided and disarmed? Why the Korea was divided? Have you ever, we always ask that question. Why? Because we were close to China and Russia? Is that, is that the reason? This is a larger, what we talked about, a larger scheme of, um, you know, the McCarthyist, um, anti-communist struggle, or the, the power for the hegemony of the U.S. at the time. All right, so the collapse of the U Soviet Union, where throughout the uh, Korea history, U.S., North Korea was under the sanctions with the U.N., I mean U.S. However, at the, um, North Korea had learned to uh, survive under the sanctions, and sanctions were not that threatening because of the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc, and they had a lot of um, other countries to do trade with. There was an alternative. Um, so, the collapse of the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc in 1990s <coughs> tremendously impacted North Korea. And that's how, and also in, in, uh, in addition, there was a, some climate uh, changes and the droughts and floods. That's how North Korea went into the famine for long years. Um, as I said, the purpose of the sanctions was to punish the government and to change the collapse, to collapse and regime change. So after the North Korea went into uh, 2006, the first nuclear war, I mean nuclear weapon test, nuclear test, and then the, the, the wave of the sanctions started. So 2002, if I just want to just give a brief, um, brief, uh, brief history is in 2002 is when um, North Korea was named as the axis of evil. However, if you remember, 1993 North Korea decided to withdraw from the NPT, Non-Proliferation Treaty, and they said we will be developing nuclear weapons since nothing has really happened. And then, oh, okay, to stop that, there was a diplomatic relations and talks were happening. Um, until 1994, there was an agreed framework that was signed, and North Korea was to abandon the, 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 the nuclear weapon program, and instead, US was supposed to build a two light water reactor that they cannot switch or replace with the plutonium, and they were supposed to bring in six 60 tons of the uh, heavy fuels. Until, from 1994, they signed. Until 2002, nothing really had happened. 
no light water reactor. So groundbreaking ceremony only happened in 2002. So North Korea said, this is not working. We are going to uh, pursue our nuclear weapons. While that is happening, so to, but then George Bush said, you are a one of the access of evil state. And then 2004, North Korea, I mean the US Congress enacted um, North Korean Human Rights Act. And we talked about human rights, how it's being appropriated by the capitalists <laughs> and imperialists. This is to promote the human rights and freedom in North Korean refugees, not North Korean people in North Korea, but North Korean refugees who fled. And also humanitarian assistance to the North Koreans in North Korea, meaning we will help them to get out of the country. Providing grants to private other organizations, non-profit <laughs> organizations to promote human rights Diplom uh, democracy and development to a market economy in North Korea. And increasing the availability of information, meaning that you can shoot the balloons out to the North Korea, send the South Korean DVDs to the North Korea. They were getting a lot of money and that those activities were promoted. And these acts, if we go back, I mean go forward, was um, increased and, and getting a lot of money from the U.S. government to South Korea. And in 2008, in addition to that, while the six-party talks were happening and it's collapsing, uh, U.S. sanctions were, U.S. law actually changed under the IEEPA and the National Emergency Act. So the president, the executive power, was able to call an emergency and then uh, impose the sanctions under the executive power without going through the Congress. <coughs> so North Korea had so many of that. Unfortunately, Obama actually uh, invented the term like smart sanctions and he signed on four additional executive orders. 2010, 2011, 2015, and 2016. These are all of the sanctions that they had added on, not only about the arms, related or the weapon programs, but about the softwares and, 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 and computer technologies, no technologies, no books, um, and also it had a huge impact on the um, medical and social structures. Next, please. Uh, okay, and then they enacted a another Congress um, Congressional sanction is under the North Korea Sanctions and Policy Enhancement of 2016. That was also done by Obama administration. The next one is, um, so the Trump comes, uh, okay, I'm running out of the time, that's why I'm like trying to run, but let's do the uh, Trump very quickly. So Trump said, uh, countering America's adversaries through sanctions act, and then he added a whole new uh, categories of sanctions. You will see there's a lot of uh, financial sanctions and then economic sanctions. Financial sanctions meaning there is a no trans, uh, transactional uh, activities in the bank or financial institutions. Why? Because there are a lot of overseas workers of North Korea working in other countries, right? So forced labor, this uh, act defined uh, forced labor. Uh, definition and anything that is created by the forced labor is not going to be passing through the uh, you know the other countries' boundaries and they are now the U.S. is punishing other countries not sanctioning North Korea. So and there is a presumption in the in the law that anything that is produced in North Korea is a forced labor. So it's really hard to you know um, fight as, as, as a country in North Korea. However, let's go next. Let's go next. And then there are many other things, and then I have listed um, other like uh, things. But you will see if you look at the sanctionable items. Always the first thing is like yacht, horse, gems, luxurious goods. So you know they are saying um, actually. We are helping uh, people, poor people, 
to fight against the regime who is benefiting and only eating the caviar. Caviar is one of the sanctionable items. <laughs> However, if you go deep onto the list, in 2013, Nodutol uh, KIP program went to, to North Korea. And then we happened to, because of the weather, we happened to stay in the rural area. And then the hotel people were panicking because, because of the sanctions, there were no plastic toilet covers in the hotel. And they were so uh, um, embarrassed to accept other foreigners into you know, the hotel because they had no plastic uh, covers on the toilet. That is a luxurious goods. And, and so then it means in a public, I mean, all the apartments the North Koreans leave, they do not have a plastic cover, I mean, the covers for the toilet. And that, that is the, the sanction, that is the thing. And it, it, it's a kind of normalcy in there because they have been living under the sanctions for 70 years. All right, next one is, I want to also say something about the delays of the medicines. So, you know, Peace, Korea Peace Now just sent out a report about very big uh, and excellent report about the impact of the sanctions. They said there is a preventable death because the, the, the delivery of the medicine came in time to the country. Then, you know, because of the vitamins, because of the antibiotics and all of these, 4,000 <coughs> cases per year can be prevented. But there is a serious delay in every stop because of the sanctions that they have to go through. And that's the impact of the sanctions. That's the war without the bullets. And then uh, just the delays in general includes that you know there was a, in October 2019, there was a World Cup qualifier game. Because of the sanctions that the camera equipment were not passing through the border to go into the North Korea. So none of the games were um, uh, covered in the media. Next, please. But in the media here was saying that North Korea played like it's waging a war in Pyongyang against the South. You know, and then they just said empty stadium amid media blackout. They didn't say much about why there was no media. The North Korean government thought if there's covered with the North Korean people, it's not good for the South Korean soccer players. So they decided no people will be coming into the stadium. 50,000 people can sit in that stadium. And there was an empty whole thing. And instead, it was covered in the US as North Korea blocked the media as if. But if you read the, 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 the inside, it, it, it doesn't say that North Korea really blocked it, blocked it. OK, so next, please. Uh, one, just one more is that. Because of the, uh, the financial sanctions, uh, the, uh, no remittances are passing through. It means that diplomats in UN, to the UN, the children had a really health, serious health issues because of the, they couldn't pay um, health insurance. So it was cut off. And then there were a, a, some kind of panic a little bit. And then you know all the Koreans in the U, uh, New York had to get together. And all the doctors who were making a regular visits because of the, the health insurance were not being paid up irregularly. Now, those are serious problems. Do you know there is a one, over 150 North Korean restaurants in the world? In Cambodia, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Malaysia, United Arab uh, Emirates, Nepal, <coughs> Mongolia, they are workers, North Korean workers are there. And they cannot send the money back to North Korea. Um, next. Okay. So I just want to say though, not everyone is US allies. Thank goodness, right? So there are, in 2019, there was a report by the Institute of Science and International Security that 56 countries were penalized for not keeping up with the UN sanctions, actually. 
you know, these countries are the ones that is still trading with North Korea and fighting against the U.S. imperialist hegemony, I guess, in the world. And they are also have to do some remedial actions and, you know, they have to give in sometimes. But it's not like, you know, as we, we think in the U.S., that North Korea is alone and it's a bad uh, bandit out there in, you know, isolated corner. Um, next is... So I just want to say, the sanctions are measures of wartime. It is a crime against humanity. It targets people. It makes an, an economic in, inflammation so high. Uh, in, not inflammation. In, inflation. 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 Inflation, thank you. Same inflation so high, so that people, they are asking people to rise up and revolt against the government, so that they can implant what? pro-U.S. government. And that's a war. That is a, a real serious war. And that kills the children, and that kills the women, as Sarah said, that kills the vulnerable people first. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Roger Ware. Roger is a spokesperson for the December 12th International Secretariat based in New York. The December 12th movement is an anti-imperialist organization in solidarity with the national liberation struggles in Africa and is focused on solidarity and ending the sanctions in Zimbabwe. Now, Roger is also a human rights attorney. That means real human rights attorney. It's a real redefining these days and has also uh, traveled many times to Zimbabwe. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Well, I'll just pick up from where Jim just left off in terms of sanctions are measures of wartime and crimes against humanity. How many people have heard of Amilcar Cabral? Okay. Most people in here have not. And I raise that because Amilcar Cabral was one of the leading theoreticians. He was the head of the liberation struggle in Guinea-Bissau and in Cape Verde Islands, and he was assassinated by the Portuguese. But among one of the things he said that are very prescient and relevant, he said, revolutionaries cannot, can claim no lies, tell no lies, or claim easy victories. And I raise that because one of the weaknesses of the movement in this country on the left is that when people hear, when you say the word sanctions, people think of Cuba, and they think of Venezuela, and they think of Iraq. And as uh, Sarah said in her introduction, they do not think of Africa in general, nor do they think of Zimbabwe in particular. And I raise it because it's very important. Last night, as it was mentioned, we had a program commemorating the, 20, the anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm X. And we decided that for that program, we were gonna deal with the question of sanctions in Zimbabwe, and people will say, well, what's the connection between Malcolm X and sanctions in Zimbabwe? And that, some people say that, you know, some people do. <laughs> but that Malcolm X, in terms of his growth and development, was a Pan-Africanist, and Malcolm X understood the connection between the struggle of African people in diaspora, particularly in the United States, and the African continent, and that one, we could not succeed with one without the other. And that was one of the reasons that he was assassinated. He was drawing those ties. He was putting the struggle on the level of, of human rights. And we thought Zimbabwe, or we think Zimbabwe is very important because Zimbabwe is the only African country to this day which has taken the stance of returning its land from the people who stole it and returning it to its people. And it's, and it's because of that that they've come under the sanctions of the United States. If you look through the, the if you if you look through the media from 1980 when Zimbabwe had its first election and President Robert Mugabe was elected president, through 2001, you'd see a sort of arc of President Mugabe was listed was 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 lauded by the West as the as the ideal democratic African president. They had elections, you know, all all that all that went on. But part of the agreement that, that led to 
the elections in Zimbabwe, there was a compromise that was made that said that if you stop the armed struggle because Zanu PF, the, the liberation struggle forces in Zimbabwe were about to take the capital of Harare. And the response of the whites was that they were bombing the hell out of the countries that were giving support, Zambia, Mozambique, they were bombing the civilian population. So in order to foreshort, to forechange that, to, to shorten that, a compromise was reached, the Lancaster House in, in Great Britain, and part of that compromise was that the whites would have a golden parachute for about 20 years in terms of representation in Parliament outside of their uh, they were percentage of the population, and that there would be a fair, um, uh, what do they call it, um, in terms of land, that people, um, you know, willing yeah, willing seller, willing seller, willing buyer in terms of <coughs> recovering the land. The Zimbabwean's position was that they were not going to pay whites to recover the land that had been stolen from them. And that, that any, any money that would be going to the white settlers would be come from subsidies from the UK and the United States. At our program last night, we had the former ambassador of the AU to the United States, uh, Dr. Arikana Chiambori Kwao, who spoke. She, she was recently relieved of her position from, as, the US ambas as the AU ambassador to the United States because she spoke out too clearly, too frequently, and too truthfully around the role of imperialism in Africa. And she said, people don't even understand how whites got the land in Zimbabwe. Once they came in Cecil Rhodes and they, they, they took the land, but particularly after World War II, whites were uh, veterans, European veterans of the World War II just given, given land. So they said what, what happened was the the, the Cecil Rhodes and, and, the, and his descendants, they divided the land up into regions. One's, one region, the two regions were, were the most fertile, or where the land was, was arable, I mean, it was beautiful. The African population, which was 95% of the population, was pushed to the least arable land, almost like dirt and desert. And a white settler would ride his horse as far as he could in each direction, east, west, north, and south, until either he got too tired or his horse got too tired, and that would be the boundary of his land. And so they had thousands of hectares of land. So when, after the uh, Lancaster House, after the war ended, after the whites got the golden parachute, when it came time for willing seller and willing buyer, uh, the United States and the UK, now the United States only nickel in that dime was that it was their kith and kin who, re who who, who were part of this, because the United States had no relationship to Zimbabwe or northern southern Rhodesia, so it could only be their ties of, that's our kith and kin, they need, they need support. When it came time to fulfill that, both the United States and the UK said, oh well, that was something that was done under Margaret Thatcher and, and, and Reagan, uh, so we don't have to honor that, as if treaties were not they didn't go along, you know, this is great democracy, treaties, are, this is the land of law, so if there's a treaty, it's supposed to be on it. It wasn't tied to whoever was the president who signed it. So they refused to deal with that. The Zimbabwean masses, particularly the war veterans' position was, we did not fight this war, we did not lose thousands and, and hundreds of, of our people to be able to have a parliament and a vote. We fought it for the land. And so they took initial steps to take the land back. The government, Zanu PF, President Mugabe, said we're going to do this in an orderly way. And so the government took the position, we're going to return the land to the people. It was at that point in time where Robert Mugabe went from the democratic African Thomas Jefferson to the black <laughs> Hitler, like overnight. Can we get back at the media? At that point, sanction, the British put sanctions on Zimbabwe. The United States put sanctions on Zimbabwe, and the United States sanctions were even more insidious because the United States hid it under the guise of democracy. The Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act of 2001 said that uh, when democracy is restored in Zimbabwe, which ignores the fact that they had had national elections and regional elections every four or five years since 1980, when, Zimbabwe, when democracy is restored to Zimbabwe, 
then the United States will withdraw the sanctions that we're imposing. The sanctions that they imposed was no bilateral loans, uh, no, no, no loans from the World Bank or the IMF because the United States controlled that. Uh, and, and so basically it was a worldwide embargo against Zimbabwe. The Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act was co-sponsored by Jesse Helms and Hillary Clinton. And the objective, as has been said, was to create regime change, to create conditions so, so bad that the people would overthrow the government. And that led, over the period of time, in 2008, there was runaway inflation in Zimbabwe that was tied, that was probably what had happened in the Weimar Republic back in the early 20th century. In 2018, under President Trump, the, the Zimbabwe Democracy Act has been actually, uh, it was amended to make it even tighter. This, this one, the, the latest one, said there's got to be guaranteed compensation to the white farmers who had the land taken from them. Oh. <laughs> and, so, and so they have been unsuccessful in terms of affecting regime change. All of the things that get laid out in the different countries in terms of the effects in terms of uh, medicine and all, of, all, of, all the effects is, is to make conditions for the masses of people worse. At this point in time, particularly, you know, it was mentioned in AU, the AU hasn't taken a position in terms of lifting the sanctions because the AU is filled with 54 African countries, a whole bunch of them are still under the sway of their former colonizers. But the Southern African Development Community, SADC, did take that position. And on the last year at their summit, they said that we're taking the position of lifting the sanctions on October 25th. They had a day where it was a kickoff of a campaign to say that all of those countries who were part of SADC were gonna, were gonna con have a continual campaign to lift the sanctions. It's because, and, and not only because of the effect on Zimbabwe, but they are a community. They are a community and they're affected by it. I'm near the end of my time, so I just want to say this very quickly. There's a growing movement in support for that, and support of lifting the sanctions. It's very important in this country that this grouping and the people that it affects understands that and lifts that up in their, in their work so that when people think of sanctions, they don't just think of Cuba or Venezuela or Iraq and Iran, they think of Africa, they think of Zimbabwe. Um, Zimbabwe is important, and, and one of the reasons why the United States and the, U and the UK and the West and the EU have focused on it is because of the precedent it has set. The land problem has not been resolved in, in Africa, it has not been resolved in particular in Southern Africa. The movement has progressed to the point where Cyril Ramaphosa, the president of Southern Africa, has taken a position that they're, they're considering taking the land back without compensation because he understands that if he doesn't do that, he's going to be overthrown by his people. So I think it's important that, that we understand here and that the, 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 the movement here take that up and push that. So I'll just leave it at that and then we can deal with some questions. Thank you very much. We're learning a lot in this, right? Yes. A lot of history. Stinky history. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's really people's history. And resistance to it, too. Our next speaker is Medea Benjamin, and she is the co-founder and director of the Dynamic Peace and Justice Organization, Code Pink. She's also a leader of the Fair Trade Advocacy Group, Global Exchange. She's the author of a number of books and articles on political issues, and she's organized tours of many countries that have been under attack by the U.S. Medea. So I want to thank um, Sarah for not only organizing this panel, but for the March, uh, well, the Sanctions Kills uh, Coalition that's so important. And we're going to have a chance in March 13th to 15th to really use the information that we're learning here and that's on the site. And in fact, 
in preparation for giving a 10 minute talk, I've read through almost every single article that's on the site of Sanctions Kill. And let me tell you, that should be like a college course. Yes. It is fantastic. So read through them. And what it will do, you know, we are people who, like our blood is already boiling by what our country is doing, but it makes you so mad to see that. It's like the mafia is in control of this country, the yeah. bullies, the sadists, uh, they are just mean, horrible people that are making people's lives miserable around the world. This is not something new. I learned by reading on your website that Woodrow Wilson in 1919 had talked about sanctions being a lethal weapon that no nation could overcome if we impose them. And we know in more recent history, we talk about Cuba sanctions being coming back 60 years ago. And you talk about the white settlers wanting to get a compensation. Same thing in Cuba. The ones living in this country want to be compensated for land they say they lost 60 years ago. And now the Trump administration has opened up the courts to allow those lawsuits to happen. You know why? To make people afraid of investing in Cuba. So these policies are, de are designed to make people's lives miserable. And as we talk, I want to bring into the room some of the people that I've met by traveling to Iran, meeting a guy in the marketplace who came over when he saw we were Americans and started crying and asking, why is your government keeping my wife from getting the cancer medicine she, she needs to survive? She is dying and she is suffering and we are suffering. And I mean, that is our government's policy to make these people suffer. Going to Cuba and going to a lovely little restaurant and learning that they've lost 80% of the business that they poured their entire life savings into because Trump now says that Americans shouldn't be traveling to Cuba. North Korea, the people, the women who now can't uh, have a job in the textile business because textiles are now illegal for anybody in the world to buy because the US just says that throwing thousands and thousands of North Korea women out of their jobs and as people have said on this it's about regime change but that's not all it's about we see in the case of attacking Venezuela Cuba Nicaragua it's about the wonderful pink tide that it happened to bring progressive governments to Latin America and create alliances like the ALBA Alliance that was an alternative to the US. And the US wants to destroy those alliances. And there's another issue I think it's important to understand. This is also about domestic politics. Because if you look at Latin America and why there's been such incredible attacks on Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua. It's not just that we want to overthrow their governments. It's that we want to please a very small right-wing sector of this community that lives primarily in Florida, primarily in Miami. And because Florida is such an important state in the elections, they are the Democrats and Republicans imposing more and more brutal hardships on people in Latin America to try to win over their votes. And I see Cassia there from Florida, and I see Camilo there from Florida. Isn't this the truth? Yes. It is disgusting, yes. and it's a bipartisan policy. So we also have to recognize, while we hope this empire dies and dies quicker than sooner than later, let's just think about the power of the dollar right now and why the U.S. could get away with these policies. One thing is, is something that the majority of this country doesn't know anything about called the SWIFT system. And it is the system of communication between banks. And it's controlled by U.S. companies. And so the U.S. can demand that the SWIFT system not uh, process transactions that go from one bank to another anywhere in the world, even if it's not a U.S. bank the smallest transaction to the biggest transaction. Also recognize that the currency for international trade is the dollar right now. That has got to change. And certainly, there are countries around the world that are experimenting and trying to get off of the dollar. But that's the only way this is really going to be changed, when there's enough strength of alternative currencies 
so that the dollar is not the number one source of international trade. The other thing that this Trump administration has done better than any others uh, recent, in recent history is really use uh, those mafia type tactics to threaten other countries if they don't obey US sanctions. And you see them threatening small countries all the time, but they threaten big countries. Look at the daughter of the billionaire from China who is under house arrest in uh, Canada right now facing extradition to the United States for having violated sanctions against Iran. They are going after the big ones as well. They are threatening China so much that China is now uh, uh, reducing the imports of oil that it has been buying from Iran. And we see that the, this administration has absolute disregard for international institutions. When Venezuela in 2018 took the United States to the International Court of Justice and won a ruling that said the United States cannot deny food and medicines, what did the US do? They withdraw from the treaty on which that uh, was based. And we, we know John Bolton, who thank goodness is no longer the National Security Advisor, but you might recall when the International Criminal Court was talking about looking into Taliban and US war crimes in Afghanistan, what did the Trump administration do? They threatened sanctions against the judges of the International Criminal Court. It is incredible. And Jeff Mackler was up here, was talking about uh, how the, after the killing of Soleimani in Iraq, how the Iraqi parliament voted to kick the US troops out of Iraq, what did the Trump administration do? Not only did they say we're going to impose sanctions on Iraq that will make the Iranian sanctions look tame, but they also said they would hold on to the oil revenues of Iraq that who knew they're in the federal bank here in New York. And the Iraqi parliamentarians looked at each other and they said that would mean the collapse of our country. So the US has just so much economic power. It is uh, mind blowing and something that has to change and more and more countries are starting to see that. I'm on my way next week to the European Parliament where we're going to have a day long discussion about this and ask why is it that the Europeans have been uh, so willing to be uh, under the thumb of the United States and how the institution that sa they set up to counter the sanctions on Iran called INSTEX has not processed one transaction since the time it was set up over a year ago. European people want to know why their governments aren't doing more. So in just the remaining two minutes I have, I want to say that we can use the power of our economic uh, 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 power as citizens, and we are doing that very differently from the way our governments do it. We are doing it from the grassroots up, as has been the tradition in the United States, civil rights movement, the farm workers movement, using campaigns of boycott, divestment, and sanctions against very repressive countries like Israel. And that is an alternative to what our government is doing. We're also starting a campaign to a boycott against Saudi Arabia, a country that has perhaps the worst human rights record in the world, but is the great ally of the United States. We are, as a community, going into our schools, our, our universities, our pension funds, and calling for divestment from the war machine. And I want to recognize Cody Urban here, who works with Code Pink, and you can talk to him about the divestment campaigns successes in our nation's capital, divesting from the war machine, successes now in universities that are calling for divestment, and I think we can add divestment uh, and the sanctions campaign as part of those local campaigns we do. We also at Code Pink take people to these countries so they can see for themselves and come back with their own stories. And I want to recognize Terry, wherever you are, Terry Matson. Don't see her. Ah, there she is. 
um, who is organizing a lot of the trips coming up to Cuba. We have trips to Iran, we have trips to Honduras, to Bolivia. If you want to learn more about them, you could talk to Terry or you could look online. And I just want to close by saying how excited I am that this movement has taken on this issue of sanctions, recognizing that sanctions is definitely no alternative to war, that sanctions is a form of warfare, that people all around the world are dying because of our US sanctions. And our job is to educate people about that, activate them, make them as angry as we are, and stop this government from imposing such horrific suffering on people around the world. Thank you, you Medea. Uh, just to also say that Code Pink is organizing a nat national webinar on um, March 11th as part of the uh, international days of, of action and it really helped kind of gear in the same way that this um, program today and this panel on sanctions being streamed being videoed there's going to be a lot of material up and a lot more a lot more uh, and it's really how you get everyone talking about this Suzanne Nelly is our next speaker and uh, she's really going to wrap up this panel and then we're opening the floor for discussion. She is a global labor and human rights lawyer and organizer and she's worked on several labor and human rights projects in the U.S. and in India and in Egypt and Turkey in all different capacities. Uh, she's a former India project coordinator of United Auto Workers. And Global Organizing Institute, and she's worked as a researcher and organizer with the International Commission for Human for Labor Rights. She's on the Bureau of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers and the National Lawyers Guild International Co-Chair. She's the daughter of Arab Teamsters. She's a longtime organizer with the Al Alda Palestine Right to Return yes. Coalition. Wow. too and try not sure, to sure. from anything. Um, so <clears throat> I just want to um, just give a random sort of appreciation uh, for Sarah for inviting me to be part of this panel, uh, for this conference and, and for the panelists who spoke before me um, and who've already sort of made a lot of the points that I was um, planning to make and so I'll try not to be repetitive. Um, and you know, before I forget, so I'm going to be talking about uh, <clears throat> the policies of sanctions and blockades and siege seen in West Asia, or the Middle East, as, as people often refer to it. Um, and <clears throat> and I'm going to be talking about U.S. policy as well as Israeli policy, which to me is an interchangeable thing. Um, they are partners in imperialism. They are partners in colonialism. They are partners in racism. Um, and I just want to mention, because I think it might I, I might uh, lose the chance to say it, that there's currently a siege on Yemen uh, that's being facilitated by the GCC, in, and the United States is also a partner in that. And that has created one of the most devastating humanitarian crises that, that we've seen in recent history, and I just want to make sure that, that we don't forget that. Um, <coughs> So many of us have already talked about sanctions as being an act of war, right? But the truth of the matter is, is that we live in a hegemony of empire where many, many people believe that it is done to avoid war, and it's done for diplomatic reasons. Um, and so that is one of the things that we need to penetrate and to expose, and, and I'm kind of looking forward to the discussion to talk about how we do that. Um, can I get the clicker, please? Signal there. Um, so in preparation for today, um, I wanted to just share this quote uh, by UN Rapporteur Alfred uh, Dezayas. Um, once in a while, UN officials do say something that could be useful. Um, and this is actually a quote from a report that he published in 2008 after visiting Venezuela. 
Modern day economic sanctions and blockades are comparable with medieval sieges of towns with the intention of forcing them to surrender. 21st century sanctions attempt to bring not just a town but sovereign countries to their knees. A difference perhaps is that 21st century sanctions are accompanied by the manipulation of public opinion through the fake news, aggressive public relations, and a pseudo-human rights rhetoric so as to give the impression that a human rights end justifies the criminal means. There is not only a horizontal ju judicial world order governed by the Charter of the UN and principles of sovereign equality, but also a vertical wor world order reflecting the hierarchy of the geopolitical system that links dominant states with the rest of the world according to military and economic power. It is the latter geopolitical system that generates geopolitical crimes, hitherto to total impunity. So in preparation for this, somebody suggested that I might want to talk about BDS a little bit because they think that talking about op opposition to sanctions will open up criticism to the BDS movement. On the one hand, I don't understand how people are so concerned with Israel's welfare. But on the other hand, <laughs> on the other hand, there is a distinct distinction between the people's sanctions and the sanctions of the empire. And the people's sanctions are the ones that are calling for entities like our labor unions to not do, to not collaborate with his or to not, or to call on the international community to not allow Israel to be part of the General Assembly or to be part of UN meetings. Those are political sanctions that have been called for by the popular Palestinian movement. And you know, the first expression of BDS intentions in this country actually came from the working class. It came from auto workers in Detroit in the 1970s. <laughs> inspired by the black movement that was happening around them and inspired by the movements uh, against imperialism around the world called for the first time in 1972 um, for boycott the divestment and sanctions from Israel. It's from the working class and the people's movement. And we also sort of know um, <coughs> that the people's movement also called for sanctions against South Africa. Um, and neither of those um, two have like actually become economic sanctions. And, I'm, and I just want to make that point that uh, when we do talk about sanctions uh, against Israel, we're very, very much talking about political sanctions. Um, but <clears throat> I don't really want to dwell on that that much. Next slide, please. So. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. I actually remember not being very, uh, not far from here. Madeline Albright was coming out of the New York Times building when I started to yell at her. <laughs> I didn't, yeah. Um, you know, I was a youth at age 17 visiting my grandparents in Jordan. Um, I accompanied my uncle to uh, Iraq, to Baghdad, where he was sending a shipment of aid. Um, in about late 1991, 92, like a year or two into the sanctions um, in Iraq. And we already sort of began to see the devastation of that war and the resulting sanctions. And those sanctions were not even actually lifted until after the US invasion. Um, and so, you know, the point that <coughs> sanctions can be, are often accompanied by war, right? And actually standing alone could be as devastating, if not more devastating, than acts of, of, of uh, military aggression. And I Iraq was um, there, you know, the, the Iraqi sanctions um, for many, you know, we sort of saw them as an act of genocide. Um, and with that, you know, and with the act of genocide, you need to show, uh, you know, the, that, <coughs> people are harmed, and you also need to show kind of the intent of, of genocide. And I think that, you know, we, we saw that um, in Iraq, and we saw that in Gaza, and, and we see that in Gaza, and arguably we can see that in other places. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on that discussion of genocide, but if folks want to talk about it during question and answer. Um, you know, I was looking through a lot of photographs, and I found this one, and you know, I don't want to just give the finger to Madame Albright for saying that 
um, the murder of you know, a half a million Iraqi children through sanctions was worth it, that's sort of a finger that I'm giving to the entire democratic establishment. Right. You know, and <clears throat> let's remember also that the sanctions were also facilitated by the UN Security Council. So not in itself, not even unilateral sanctions. It was specifically, it was um, an example of, of like a, a very direct um, sanctions of imperialism of, of, of empire, and it. <clears throat> destabilized Iraq and brought it back to the to the um, <clears throat> to a uh, pre-industrial age and it set them up for further invasion. And it was only lifted um, in 2003 um, when um, the United States actually had control of their oil reserves. Next slide, please. So I just want to quickly talk about Gaza. So, um, and this is a picture from the uh, March of Return that uh, began in March 2018, um, <clears throat> which was a march of really hundreds of thousands of Gazans who went to the border to demand that they that the siege and the blockade be broken and that they have um, the opportunity to go back to their lands, uh, which is their right under international law. Next slide, please. Um, and this is a map of Gaza uh, that shows how Gaza continues to sort of be uh, kept under siege from the Egyptian border um, <clears throat> and uh, throughout this area controlled by Israel with one small crossing here uh, that is very difficult to get out of. Rafa is also very difficult to get out of to um, US backs the Egyptian government and through the sea where fishermen are actually uh, restricted to the most barren areas of the sea, and if they try to pass through those areas of the sea, they get shot at or their boats get um, sunk. And <clears throat> a lot of people sort of see the siege of Gaza as beginning in 2007, uh, but actually there have been many sort of periods of time when Israel was tightening sort of the control and, and um, tightening areas of siege on Gaza, at first in 1987 in response to the first intifada, then again in 1994, um, and then in 2007, after Hamas was elected to a uh, leadership position in Gaza, uh, they declared a siege uh, with the support of the United States, uh, and they began a policy of restricting uh, sort of basic humanitarian goods, um, which um, the result end was in, 2000, well, in 2012, the UN said by 2020, Gaza would be unlivable. And it is 2020, and Gaza is unlivable. Um, next slide, please. Um, you can keep going, I'm gonna skip this. Um, yes. This is just um, a fist, and in Arabic it says, which, which means uh, we want to live. And that's sort of been the, sort of the, one of the basic demands of the people of Gaza, the demand that they're bringing um, to the March of Return. No. Um, you know, there's a lot of details about sort of uh, um, the facts of, of the blockade on Gaza and, you know, the sanctions on Iraq. Um, and there's a lot of details also about how the U.S. has been complicit in it. And I just want to make sure that I mention that one of the ways that the U.S. has been compl complicit in it is by criminalizing any of us here who try to support Gaza, who try to bring money to Gaza. And there's so many cases of egregious ways that people have been criminalized. Now, for the question and answer period, you know, what I would love to talk about is that, <clears throat> how can we then, and speaking as a human rights lawyer, you know, how, how do we then work to penetrate, right, penetrate this hegemony of empire? So, to, so we don't just look at sanctions as a humanitarian thing, and because then the solution will just be humanitarian. We have to look at the underlying sort of subtext, the underlying motivations, the underlying reasons, which is to stop resistance to empire, to stop resistance to capitalism, right? Um, and <clears throat> what is that relationship to security and, and, and how they, um, they talk about terrorism and how they talk about, and, and what is that relationship to how they act at the border and denying uh, water for migrants who are coming across the border? Um, so, you know, <clears throat> that's, you know, that's something I feel like that we are going to have to really think about. And, 
And in, in doing that, we get to sort of reclaim what internationalism is. We get to sort of claim, you know, what these sort of international legal, me legal mechanisms that were put together is. And I just want to, um, I mean, one example in that is, you know, there's this big, big movement in the U.S. in support of land so of food sovereignty. And in the most radical expressions of those movements are that we need to take back the land, we need to decolonize the land. Well, you know, the people of Zimbabwe did that, right? And let's talk about then how we can support, how we can support that and how we can sort of recreate that here. So um, thank you very much. Well, we want to open the floor. Uh, we're going to do this, I think, a little differently. Um, and that is both questions, concrete suggestions also, uh, some of the things you think are possible to do in the period ahead. That would be good to hear. And then I'm going to ask the panel to at least address one of the things that they hear as it relates to their work. So it, it won't necessarily be a back and forth, it's kind of absorbing, everybody's taking out their pens now, that's good, up here, take some notes. Uh, and in terms of, of listening to the audience. So, okay, right in the back here. Yes. Good afternoon, comrades. My name is Asante Boy and Chroma Ture with Black Alliance for Peace. Uh, my question is for Brother War uh, Roger. Uh, Alicia Garza, one of the three founders of Black Lives Matter, has with others formed a think tank and political organizing group, Black to the Future Action Fund. And they and another organization, Black Women Four, have now come out to endorse Elizabeth Warren in spite of the fact that Warren supported sanctions against Venezuela, and she said that in a podcast this past fall. What are your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the liberal. And that's the liberal too, Roger. That's the liberal. Um, okay, other? We're going to, as I say, we're going to take questions here. Lucy? Um, Good afternoon, everybody. I think it's afternoon. I'm, I'm not sure. We've been here for so long, right? But learning a lot. Um, just a concrete um, action. My name is Lucy Paguada Quesada. I represent the Libre Party from Honduras, which is the political arm of the Honduran resistance. But um, I think that one of the important aspects that we also need to discuss here is diffusion. How do we take to others while we are in, in this conversation here. So a concrete action is to bring sanctions, the theme of sanctions to our media. And I just want to uh, let the audience know that I lead a program at WBAI. It's called Voices of Resistance. It airs live on Sundays um, at one o'clock. And this Sunday, we're going to be speaking about sanctions in Africa, particularly on Zimbabwe, and we've been doing a lot of conversations around the topic of um, sanctions as well. So tune in tomorrow, we're gonna to be talking about that. I think it is very important for us to bring what we do to other audiences, to bro uh, broader audiences, so we need to develop our own um, ways of communicating with the bigger, the bigger world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, right here. Hi, I'm Danny Haifong with Black Report. Uh, just another note on concrete things that can be done. So, uh, China right now is going through uh, the coronavirus uh, effort to eradicate the disease. And China is actually a huge country that assists a lot of nations that are under sanctions. And the racist environment that's being whipped up around the coronavirus is creating an atmosphere in the United States. I think most people here probably know that you know, people on the streets are more concerned because of the media hysteria about the coronavirus, about this disease, than the sanctions that we're talking about that are killing so many. And so um, 
at this table here with uh, my comrade Sue Hin. Uh, we're selling my book to um, give donations to Wuhan for coronavirus supplies and, and medical solidarity. There's also a petition that Sue Hin is passing around that says no to racism against China and to um, be in solidarity with their efforts as well as to uh, call for the United States to provide adequate health care here for so many who are dying of things like the uh, flu. So um, please see us and we also have a program on Monday uh, where I know Sarah will be talking about it too. Uh, where we'll be talking about the coronavirus and China and what role does China play in the world right now. I know it's a, it's a big hot topic among the anti-war left. So thank you. Thank you, Danny. Um, yeah, that would be Monday night with Danny speaking and Suvin Lee and AJ Noel. And, um, so it's like the UNAC conference extends <laughs> where we'll continue the discussion on the coronavirus. Yeah, right, it certainly does. How about right here? Hi, I'm John from Alabama. And uh, last July, uh, I participated in a Veterans for Peace delegation to Nicaragua. And during that delegation, uh, we were given a tour of a newly opened hospital in Managua. Uh, and that giving the tour was a physician who uh, she heads up the National Health Service. And during that tour, she indicated that she um, had been uh, asked to give a, a talk at, the, at a health conference at the UN, but the newly passed NECA Act had put her on the sanctions list, and therefore she couldn't, she had to cancel that trip and that uh, conference. So <clears throat> my question then would be, you know, is just does, does it do any good for me to to lobby and express my concern with my congressmen and senators about this this kind of thing, or or is that itself hopeless? Good question. How about ice break in? Hi, uh, my name is Ike Nahum. I'm with the New York, New Jersey, Cuba Sea Coalition. Woo! Woo! Cuba we're part of uh, the uh, organizing for a conference like this one that's going to be focused on U.S.-Cuba normalization and fighting the U.S. economic and political war against, uh, against revolutionary Cuba. Many of the folks on the podium and here have endorsed it. I would... Uh, Everybody check out the card and, and go on the site. I just want to say when we're talking about sanctions um, and the U.S., the role of U.S. imperialism in fighting every, against every struggle that poses a pr progressive and revolutionary change, that Cuba is the model for that. Woo! Cuba is the Yay! classic textbook case of uh, sanctions, blockading, using economic pressure, political hostility, uh, and, and every nasty, dirty, brutal, violent thing that they can. So please, uh, we're all part of the same struggle. And the last point I'd like to make is that even though the effects, the impact of sanctions on all these uh, uh, countries and movements, uh, it's horrible, and we all know that. I just got back from Cuba, and I could begin to see the latest tightening of the screws and how it's impacting on the Cuban working class. But we should understand politically that these are reflections of the political weakness of imperialism in this period, and we should never forget that. And you think is a, a sponsor of that conference and there's people to go. Also, Dale Walker from IFCO Pastors for Peace, another UNAC affiliated group, was supposed to be on the panel, but instead she took the opportunity to be in Cuba to do some very important work. Okay, back here. Okay. Yeah. Form your own mind. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Some other hands here. <laughs> okay. Um, my question is, of course, everybody knows my question already. <laughs> Some people do. 
Um, how do we do a better job okay. in the anti-war movement in like linking the sanctions here at home? Uh, a bunch of us just uh, were found guilty uh, for trying to keep thousands of people's general assistance on. What that means is $200 a month, which thousands of people in the state of Pennsylvania relied upon for water, food, and all the basic necessities of life, that is gone now. Um, and so I just want to know, how do we link those better? Who are you, please? I'm Sherry Hakala with the Poor People's Army and the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, I'm Marty Goodman, a retired transit worker, socialist action. I wanted to point to the dangers of sanctions and applaud everyone who's working on this issue. I want to address the situation in Haiti and as quickly as I can. Uh, the uh, coups there, the CIA coups, set up a dynamic against the uh, popular forces, quote unquote. I just want to say that sanctions are used by the right wing and the liberals to impose its own solution on particular countries. The uh, Black Congressional Caucus lobbied heavily for sanctions on Haiti during the coup and for uh, invading, invading Haiti. And the economy of Haiti was dis distorted and in many ways destroyed, particularly the rice crop. And now the Haitians who used to produce rice uh, uh, for its own needs now has to import rice from Miami at greater expense, by the way. Uh, also, the uh, racist immigration blockade around Haiti was implemented by Bush, Bush one, and by Bill Clinton, who was afraid that a racist backlash against Haitians would hurt his chances. So he opposed a totally illegal uh, blockade, military blockade around Haiti to stop refugees from uh, coming to South Florida, where I used to live. Uh, even Bernie Sanders uh, voted for an occupation of Haiti the US-UN uh, occupation of Haiti, which lasted for years and resulted in violence against the democratic movements and uh, imposition of a World Bank agenda. So I would like to say, ask how people can explain the dynamics, the seemingly complex and paradoxical dynamics of the sanctions by US imperialism and maintain uh, an eye on the working class and progressive forces. How you can explain that to the American people? I'd like some help. Thank you. Okay. Um, firstly, uh, thank you for uh, the panelists' remarks. They're very insightful. Um, I'm Nina. I'm with the International League of People Struggle, which is an anti-imperialist alliance around the world. Um, so I just wanted to offer some remarks on um, the opportunities that the sanctions campaign presents, in my opinion. So I think, one, I, the campaign, um, something that's really exciting is that uh, a, a sanctions campaign like this that brings together various diasporic groups <coughs> that have been opposing sanctions and really uh, attacks of U.S. imperialism for so long now. So I think that's really um, a great opportunity, a great campaign to bring together these groups that have been separately fighting their own campaigns in their home countries uh, here in the U.S., right? Um, so I think that's one opportunity, really bringing it back to uh, you know, the struggles, uh, the struggle for national liberation around the world. Um, and I think secondly, um, an opportunity that uh, the sanctions campaign presents is an opening to discuss imperialism as a global economic system and not merely the most egregious acts uh, of militarism, occupation, and war. Uh, that we always see in the news. And I think the question of young people always comes up at these conferences. 
But I think that definition of imperialism is really lacking right now among the younger generation, right? So I think that um, education of imperialism and using the sanctions campaign as a concrete opening towards that analysis is really key. Um, and I think, uh, you know, really programming the campaign to have concrete gains um, and broadening the anti-imperialist movement and bringing in young people. And thank you, Sarah, for mentioning this, but the International League of People's Struggle is having uh, another study here in New York on Thursday, February 27, at 6.30 uh, 39 Eldridge Street. And you can see uh, the table at the back for more details. But these are, ju these are just some thoughts um, on the opportunities that the campaign presents. So again, thank you again for your comments. That was pretty heavy. I, I, as I bounce this back to the panel here, um, and they'll each have to take about three to four minutes because while we were speaking, I saw trays of sandwiches coming in here. And nobody's allowed back there yet. They're all covered, don't worry. But um, right after the panel answers, we are going to take a really short break um, and then come back with Glenn uh, Porto beans. Um, well, people, people should well, Okay, we'll, we'll figure that out. And uh, we have reports on the RNC actions and the DNC actions all during lunch. So uh, let me pass this back to the panel. And uh, I think each of you could either answer one question that, that um, particularly you felt fit for, for you or uh, a point that kind of came from this whole discussion. Uh, I'll leave that up to each panel. Um, yeah, so um, I'll quickly answer, uh, give two answers to, to one question I heard here and two questions I heard here. Um, the question about, like, is it worth sort of making your voice heard to Congress? And, you know, I mean, sometimes I feel like yes, and sometimes I feel like it's, who knows, like it could be a complete waste of time. But then speaking about uh, like my my experience in the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, right? We have a representative in the UN Human Rights Council, and it, it seems futile sometimes, uh, like what we try to raise there. But the thing is, is that like oftentimes if we don't raise it and our allies don't raise it, no one is going to raise it. And like it, like we we've we've seen moments when we thought that like. Palestine was going to be completely removed from the agenda, or, or, or like sanctions was going to be completely removed from the agenda, right? Um, and, <clears throat> you know, we've also, at the NLG, like we've uh, like lobbied, um, we've got congressional members to sign a letter um, saying that the Lahey law was being violated by giving arms to Egypt and giving arms to Israel, and like the letter reached kind of the like the highest echelon that it could go, like the, where we got the, the Congress to sign it, but there was nothing that could be done, um, right, at all. But at least it angered Netanyahu, he tweeted about it, right? So, I mean, it comes a little bit of comfort, and, but particularly when it comes to somebody being denied the ability to come and talk about what's happening in Nicaragua, that gives it, um, yeah, or yeah, that, or in Latin America, that, that gives it, um, more power, right? It gives it more power than like if, if, if no one's hearing about it. So I think that that's important. Um, just in the question of like you know how do we relate uh, like this this discussion to you know what's happening to poor people? Um, <clears throat> how do we sort of relate it to you know people's inability to have like oppose what you know what was going on in Haiti? And I, and I think it kind of gets back to this question of like you know um, you know we could talk about you know the impact of sanctions. Um, and how it violates international humanitarian law, and how it violates like uh, basic human rights, and, and, and we can appeal to people on, on, in a humanitarian framework and say that like this is harming people. Um, but you know the subtext, you know the, and the subtext or the um, legitimization of these sanctions um, is a process like in that quote is accompanied by. Well, it's accompanied by this whole kind of like narrative, including um, identifying whole populations as terrorists, identifying whole populations as criminals, identifying whole populations as security threats, identifying whole populations as gang members, right? And and that would just and that justifies it. That justifies not being able to give water to migrants trying to cross the border. 
and it, it, it justifies ill treatment of prisoners in, 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 in you know in our in enormous incarceration. So, so that is what we need to sort of penetrate. And in some ways, speaking of the human rights side, we need to reclaim. I mean, we either throw out the human rights framework or we reclaim it, right? Because it, all it does is serve American hegemony and this false dichotomy of what's good and what's bad, and like um, because it's being used to sort of say that like some human beings deserve rights and others don't, right? And so, um, so I guess it depends on the strategy. So, um, Lucy, thank you for the programs that you're doing, and I hope that Sarah, we can help you to get sort of the best of these programs. Uh, up on that website and get more of them because um, we are all learning from each other in this process and there is so much to learn. Um, uh, in that vein, uh, there is a media outlet that the U.S. doesn't like because it gives you an alternative view and that's Telesur coming from Latin America. And Elliot Abrams, the evil Elliot Abrams, every time we say his name we should say boo. Um, he just said he wants to take measures against Telesur and they're very worried that that means cutting off their access to be heard in the U.S. So we're going to need a campaign uh, to support the right of Telesur to broadcast here in the U.S. And then, um, and RT as well. And then in terms of this uh, issue about worth lobbying, it is important to lobby. This might not be the group that likes doing it, and luckily there are other people who might like that a little better. But um, there are bills like Ilhan Omar just came out with a, a group of seven bills, and one of them is precisely on sanctions to take away the power of the executive to so easily impose sanctions and to force government to evaluate uh, the effect of those sanctions. So that's a good bill for us to be promoting. There's other bills that we've been working on that are strictly very, very, very now are about humanitarian aid, uh, aid not being able to get through in Venezuela, in Iran. And these are really educational for the uh, Congress people themselves because they think that those exemptions actually work when they don't work. So it is important to be lobbying and there are Congress people who do help get uh, exemptions to those visa denials. Um, and then lastly, uh, Sherry, you're the greatest at doing this, so you have to teach us about how to relate the issues of uh, the domestic and the international. But one area where we have to do a much better job in the future is around the Pentagon budget. And now during this time of the uh, primaries and then the elections, it's really a time to push, push, push. And Elizabeth Warren, who has a plan for everything, does not have a plan for cutting the Pentagon budget. But she is the only one who's actually put out a figure of cutting $80 billion a year from the Pentagon slush fund called the Overseas Contingent Operations. Uh, but uh, Bernie has no plan for cutting the Pentagon budget, nor did the, any of these others. And that, of course, is the golden egg that could liberate all of this money for all of the domestic needs we have here at home. I'm not quite sure why Sister Ture directed the Elizabeth Warren question to me. You know why, Roger. You know why. Uh, I'm afraid to ask why. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I don't support Elizabeth Warren <laughs> and neither does organization. But I think the, the point is, I think this, this whole discussion has got to be looked at from the perspective of we're in a struggle for propaganda. We're not, in a, we're not at a stage here of armed struggle. We're in a struggle for propaganda. We're really trying to reach the minds of the masses of people in the United States and encounter a 24-hour relentless right-wing propaganda surge, you know, that it, so it makes, we're in, a, we're in a minority in that. So we have to use every, every possible, you know, every possible um, weapon to do that. So, you know, taking stuff to Congress or taking stuff to local people, taking stuff to the United Nations, is not with, we started going, our organization started going to the United Nations in 1989 around the question of political prisons in the United States. And in the process of doing that, it became very clear, particularly the Cubans made it clear to, to us that around the issue of racism in, in the United States, one of the weaknesses 
of the black movement had been in terms of implementing what Malcolm talked about is that you come once, you make a great speech, and they don't see you again. In the United Nations, things are done incrementally. They're done like, do you dot this, you dot this I, or you cross this T? But it's a propaganda vehicle. The Cubans were very, very expert in terms of understanding that the United Nations isn't going to resolve it, nor is the United States Congress. But the the the, the propaganda that goes around that in terms of educating people to either the limits or ineffectiveness of that, of the need for mass struggle, of understanding what the issues. That's what we have to understand when we talk about what tactics do we employ to to make our point. So whether we take on Elizabeth Warren around the, the, the hypocrisy of, of, or the double-sidedness double of, not, of, of not raising, uh, of lifting sanctions on Venezuela or not taking a position on things, that's got to be from our perspective of what is it that we want to accomplish. So I think that's what I mean. Elizabeth Warren in Venezuela, yeah, we should make the demand. By making the demand, we highlight what the issue is. The same thing in terms of we've gone to the Congressional Black Caucus around the question of of uh, Zimbabwe because they signed on to the, they signed on to it. So it's, it's we go to them saying that you were there supposedly as the voice of the black community. At least that's how it started out, <laughs> and right. now you're taking a position which is really Trumpian around the question of around sanctions on a, a country which has done no more than have the audacity to say, we want our land back and we're going to do it and we're going to take it and we're going to defend it. So I think that's how we should look at and answer these questions that people talk about. There's no one tactic um, that, that does all, but we have to look at it from our perspective of does it advance our ability to reach people and highlight what the issues are. So, thank you. I, uh, whenever we talk about the tensions against the North Korea, a lot of people are saying that it is um, the sanctions are one way to stop North Korea from going nuclear. So that they think it is justified, and it, even if it doesn't work, there's nothing else that they will be like you know they can impose. So people are saying that like, unlike other countries, I think North Korea deserves to be punished for its nuclear development. This is a for um, the, the challenge that we need to work with. And we have been, you know, that's why we go into how North Korea has persistently saying that they want to denuclearize the entire peninsula. That, that North Korea has been under uh, nuclear threat from the US and that's the why they had to go to that thing, uh, the path. And also, like, you know, all that, but I think uh, through the sanctions kill campaign that we have also learned that there are so many other, um, you know, 40 some odd countries that is under the US-led unilateral sanctions and that we can connect with this movement. Um, and, and that US government or US people that has to really understand as long as this is, there's a no justified Sanctions. It's a, it's a means of going into a war uh, without maybe the armed conflict. But um, I think we need to also enlarge our campaign, learn about from each other, and tactics too, and then also increase the intersectionality with you know, the uh, divest movement, the climate justice movement, and bring it to um, the home front, like you know, the, we have to do something about the sanctions that our government is imposing on other uh, countries. So it is our responsibility in the U.S. that stops and, and make our government to do the right thing, rather than to threat and to uh, expand our imperialist power. I just want to say something that I learned from um, uh, this year is that, you know, not only the economic sanctions and all that, but U.S. is also pressuring South Korea from engaging with North Korea, right? So in January 16th, I'm not sure if you know, but the Harris, Harry Harris, the, the U.S. ambassador to Seoul, Korea said, if you are going to talk to, uh, engage with North Korea, you better have a, some kind of consultation before with the U.S. government. And that may 
rear an uproar in the South Korean uh, people. And they were like, you know, we are a sovereign country and this is not the way that, you know, they are, they, the, the U.S. should do with its ally countries. So, I mean, of course, um, there's a lot of movement already in, in these countries are trying to be like, you know, uh, fighting and resisting. But as a people in the, in the U.S., I think we can connect with the people in these countries and work together. And let me ask in the booth here, hello, yeah, if you can bring up uh, the sections. Um, and, um, got to go all the way back. Oh. Yeah, yeah, the one just before that. Yeah, um, yeah. That's the message. That's the message. Now, sometimes people, you know, put down a conference where there are a lot of political people, and they say, "Oh, you're just preaching to the choir." But I'll tell you, when, when people sing with one voice, it is the most powerful thing. And it can overwhelm all kinds of discordant background noise. So it's very important for our movement as a whole to talk to each other and to also begin to speak more and more with one voice where we're listening to each other but in harmony that is a really important part of political organizing and we've got to think even how to bring in a campaign now you see that sign u.s sanctions kill women in 39 countries signs like that and there are lots of them on the website about the impact on women could go to every International Women's Day event in the next couple of weeks, right? And March, which is International Women's Month. So you want to take some of the material that's there and utilize it and make it part of what you're doing. Very important part also, of the, and the question of how, how to link it to conditions right here at home. Now, how many people here, even at any health conference, could raise, what if, what if no one here suddenly had access to diabetes medicine, or heart medicine, or cancer medicine, or flu shots, or vaccines? You needed any kind of penicillin or antibiotic in the past year or two. You could do a poll at almost any health event and it immediately brings it home because it, it does raise a question of what do people here and in the whole world have a right to? Have a right to. 80,000 people in the U.S. died of flu last year. That's how bad the medical system is here. That's how bad it's so damn expensive even to go to a doctor. People wait until they're in the final stages of pneumonia. We gotta link it even if we're talking about water to say, how about when you talk, if a whole country is drinking water like they drink in Flint or Newark. See, bring it home here, but talk about also what's happening there. I, I think this is really important. The more we're thinking of raising the question of what we have a right to here and what the people of the whole world have a right to. It, it goes back to that point, we have a right to live. Uh, the final thing is on the military budget because 10% left the whole military budget. My God, you could remake the whole planet about 10 times over. 10% of the military budget would end poverty, hunger, homelessness, planet-wide, planet-wide. I mean, this is a huge, huge waste, but it's not a waste to the capitalists. It's a source of endless guaranteed profit, giant subsidy. So we're, we're talking about both the militarism and, and denying people all over the world and that is what imperialism does. It doesn't build up, it only extracts. 
And the only way the U.S. seems to go forward is to bring other countries down. <coughs> so we got to stand up against that. That builds solidarity. Everywhere in the world, it, uh, folks take interest. What? There are people in the U.S. who are addressing this? So there is a table over there, uh, all focused on all different sanctions material. I do hope you'll like stop by there. I hope you'll think about how to you know, really make this part of what you're doing and what you're already doing and how to make it even more a part of what you're doing. Uh, and since we have one minute before this session ends, I'm going to hand it over to Joe to tell us what we're doing the rest of the day. But I, I want to thank everybody who was, you know, with us.